Hi, I'm Chris Horner. Thanks for joining me on GreenTV.com for this episode of Business Earth. As part of GreenTV.com's mission to help build deeper eco-knowledge, Business Earth is dedicated to bringing you compelling and positive science-based stories about green technologies, businesses, and initiatives, and the people behind them, helping civilization to transition away from our deeply troubled fossil fuel-based economy toward a cleaner and more just regenerative one. How to get from here to a better and doable there. Before meeting our guest, and with thanks in advance, please subscribe to greentv.com and our companion YouTube channel, where by clicking the show more button just above the comment section, you'll find links to Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and other social media. Please share our program, website, and your comments with your circle to help us grow and to help spread green TVs and your insights about building a better, greener, and more hopeful future. Okay, onward. Let's meet our guest. So today we're speaking with Merrick Gertler, uh, eminent Canadian uh, geographer, I have to refer to my notes every now and then. A uh, regional planner, author, longtime professor, senior, senior university administrator, and since 2013, president of the University of Toronto. And for sharing U of T's ambitious efforts to reach a negative climate footprint by 2050. And uh, full disclosure, Merrick and I have known each other since the fourth grade and have been uh, good good friends since that time. So uh, welcome, Merrick, and uh, thanks so much for being with us today on Green Thank TV. you. Thanks, Chris. It's, oh, you're, it's, a, real, it's a real pleasure. Uh, we'll get back to the, uh, the, the climate footprint uh, part in a minute. But um, first, uh, very briefly, I just want to set the background stage of Toronto and uh, University of Toronto. So uh, just a brief overview. Um, Toronto is obviously Canada's largest uh, preeminent city. Uh, what's the population these days, Merrick? So the city of Toronto is just a shade under 3 million. The metropolitan region is closer to 6 million. So it is uh, a, um, a booming metropolis. Uh, I think the fourth largest city in North America, if I'm not mistaken, and one of the most rapidly growing were a major uh, receiving destination for immigration from around the world, which is uh, fueling population growth at quite an impressive clip. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been keeping track a little bit, but uh, having been a, you know, a former resident back when we were in elementary school and um, um, and it, it, as far as the University of uh, Toronto goes, uh, three campuses. Um, the the primary one is, uh, I guess, is is uh, Central Toronto St. George campus, and um, which is really a city within a city. It seems um, it really um, is. What is the uh, what is the what are the number of students at at each of the campus and the total? Uh, I mean, just to give us an idea of this sure this city of. Well, it really is. We're a mid-sized city, really. In total, our enrollment across three campuses is about 95,000 students this year. So uh, round number is about 60, 65,000 at the historic St. George campus in downtown Toronto and between 15 and 16,000 students at each of our two suburban campuses, our University of Toronto Mississauga and University of Toronto Scarborough. Those were campuses built in the mid 1960s to uh, help uh, bring higher education to the burgeoning suburbs. So to, to, I, 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 it, the total number is uh, about, ni about 95,000 students. Geez. And then on top of that, Chris, we've got about 20, 25,000 faculty and staff. So, you know, you're looking at about 120,000 bodies in total. Yes. Uh, just on our St. George campus alone, on any given day, we estimate the population at about 80,000 people. And are your subjects loyal, Merrick? Uh, every one of them, <laughs> completely loyal. They all do my bidding. Well, you know, you know what academics are like, and this is kind of relevant to our discussion, right? Because they are independently minded, they are evidence-based, they are argumentative in the best sense of the 
the word. And a lot of that, uh, those qualities have been brought to bear on our story about uh, uh, enhancing our sustainability. Let, let's move on a little bit to the to the uh, the climate prop uh, positive initiative, which is really the, the subject that I you know I wanted to, to get to today. Um, and uh, when you originally told me about it, um, I just sort of fell in love with you know there are other you know there are other pro collaborative projects obviously going going on around the world, but this one seems you know, a, a, the downtown uh, location and uh, really it's a, it's a big, it's a big project for, uh, you know, uh, for the, for the university to take on. And um, it's really indicative of the kind of sort of intramural cooperation that's required in order to make, to really make a dent in uh, making the green transition happen this is really kind of for me where the rubber hits the road to get a bunch of uh you know disparate uh interests together to make something happen so mm -hmm. um um could you uh briefly describe you know what what the project is what you're going for yeah. what's the what's the history some of the performance expectations and yeah. uh what you what you expect the the roi you know the economic how, how you expect the economics to work over time sure so our goal is to become not just net zero, but climate positive by 2050, if not sooner. In other words, really to convert our um, university to a carbon sink where, where we're absorbing more carbon than we are emitting, um, <clears throat> which is a pretty uh, audacious goal, uh, but one that we think is achievable. Um, we'll have some checkpoints along the way. So, uh, for example, you know, by the end of this decade, by 2030, uh, we uh, expect to have reduced our emissions by more than 50 percent. Um, wow. And I mean, that's a big number in percentage terms. It's also a big number in absolute terms. So, you know, currently we emit about 100 and just shy of 110,000 metric tons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions every year. Uh, and so, you know, we're talking about reducing that by more than 50,000 tons uh, by the end of 2030 and, you know, eliminating that completely uh, by 2050. And indeed, as I say, going beyond that to become a real carbon sink. So that's the objective. Um, Part of the backdrop for this is that you know Canada has a national carbon tax system in place. And so the University of Toronto as a major emitter uh, is subject to that tax. Um, so it costs us real dollars every year, which um, we are highly motivated to reduce over time. And so the payback for us, at least in financial terms will be uh, through uh, the reduction in carbon tax that we would otherwise be paying and that has given us a very strong incentive to to make a couple of moves, which I'd be happy to describe to you in further detail. Well, I mean, I, I guess one of the things that, you know, I, I am interested in because really uh, for this for this uh, transition to sustainability and sort of re a more regenerative economy to happen, these things have to work economically. And sure um, so I'd, I'd be curious to know a little bit more, just, you know, just yep. briefly on that, that level, what, you know, yep. what your expectations are. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll describe a recent deal that we announced this past July, uh, which was $56 million in financing provided through an organization called the Canada Infrastructure Bank. This is a federal crown corporation set up by the, uh, the federal government five or six years ago to accelerate investments in infrastructure that would have social impact. Could be transportation, could be uh, clean energy and climate uh, related uh, objectives, and it could be affordable housing. I mean, a lot of uh, worthy uh, causes that could be covered by this. We uh, recognized that the bank was in a position to bring in some private creditors, some private lenders, and uh, bring their own uh, capital to the table as well. Um, and the deal that we did 
um, actually uh, creates a 25 year loan for us at very preferential rates. The, 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 the interest rate has been reduced by the participation of the Canada Infrastructure Bank, whose presence basically guarantees the project and de-risks it for private lenders. Uh, so, you know, we're only putting up about 10% of the cost of the project that will be funded. The rest will come through debt that we pay back over 25 years and over very preferential rates. Uh, and it will, we, we figure, be more than offset by the savings in terms of the carbon tax that we would otherwise have to pay. So for us, it uh, it's a tr tremendous deal. That deal is accelerating uh, our progress towards our goals by 10 years. Wow. It's, it's on the basis of that that we're going to be able to cut our emissions by 50% before 2030. It involves uh, replacing some of our, um, our furnaces that are currently uh, powered by natural gas uh, to electric. Uh, we have a big district heating system. Uh, it's currently powered by uh, natural gas. Uh, so those will be, you know, converted to electric. We'll be doing deep energy retrofits of our buildings. Our St. George campus is historic. You know, we'll be celebrating our 200th anniversary in 2027. The average age of our buildings is 80 years old. Uh, and we have, you know, many that are, you know, 100, 120 years old. So you can just imagine what the energy bill uh, is like on those buildings. But the good news is that, um, you know, by doing some deep retrofits, we can substantially improve the uh, energy consumption on those buildings. And you know, we'll be doing a lot of other uh, novel things in this kind of concentrated downtown area that will um, really help us reduce our footprint and will we'll make really good economic sense as well. So that, that kind of um, novel financial model was one that has really worked to accelerate uh, this this process. Had we not had that available, we might have contemplated something like a green bond, where we would go to the credit markets and um, you know offer up debt to cover these things. Uh, we know that demand for such credit instruments has been growing as uh, investors, large and small, uh, look for you know green ways to uh, invest their capital and to um, assist uh, the, the progress of the planet towards meeting its climate goals. Um, and we were prepared to go that route, although I think the transaction costs for us would have been substantially higher to kind of uh, you know, create the, those kinds of uh, facilities. Uh, in the end, we were delighted when the infrastructure bank came along and um, began talking to us about this. Yeah, they, yeah. We were the first university in the country that they worked with and they picked us in part because of our size, recognizing that they could make a really big impact quickly, uh, but also recognizing that other universities across the country and indeed beyond would look at what we're doing and say, hey, you know, how do we get a piece of that action? Yeah. So I've had I've had people from South Africa come and ask about this deal, as well as, you know, um, people from uh, around North America. And I, I think it's going to attract a lot of attention. Yeah, that's it's it's wonderful. They so you you're basically a a pilot in a way for many similar hopefully many similar kinds yeah. of uh cooperative deals like this around the world. Exactly. You know, exactly. Uh, one, one thing I I I did want to ask you so you know briefly the the players that were you know you've spoken about the bank who are, who are the other players in this uh sure and and how did it uh, you know when did it come together and uh, how did it come together because that that cooperation is really uh such an important part of making these things happen and getting everybody on the same team and i'm assuming you were you know a, a major part of uh you know you 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 know your skills are your, your diplomatic skills are are wonderful and um, getting everybody to be on the same team and work in the same direction. I'd like to yeah. know a little bit more about that. Yeah, forging consensus is really important, you know, aligning people, first of all, that they have a shared sense of the problem. And secondly, that they uh, are prepared to roll up their sleeves and work together towards a, a common solution. So uh, this started in 2015. When, um, among other things, uh, I received a petition from a number of members of our community 
here at the University of Toronto to divest uh, our endowment and pension fund from fossil fuels. Uh, hardly the only university president in the world to receive such a petition. Um, long story short, you know, uh, we did eventually uh, divest and that, uh, you know, that's another conversation we can have, but about uh, uh, roughly a year ago this time, we made some major commitments just before COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, but back to 2015, in responding to the petition, one of the things that we did was to say, well, you know, uh, yes, we, we need to rethink how we make our investments, but we also have an opportunity to uh, achieve our climate related goals through, uh, you know, rethinking the way that we manage our operations. We have, you know, three campuses, a big footprint, 130 plus buildings. Um, so that's a good place to start. Secondly, we we're a teaching organization and we should be rethinking how we ensure that every one of our students, no matter what they study, has an opportunity to become familiar with the basic concepts of sustainability. Third, we do a ton of research, you know, in engineering and in the physical sciences and natural sciences, but also in the social sciences and humanities where um, there's a lot of work being done that actually informs government responses and private sector responses to the climate crisis understanding how you change the behavior of individual economic actors. Well, you know, that's a, a core social science question, for example. So um, we thought as a way of uh, organizing the efforts that the university uh, should be spearheading in all of these areas, we would create a new committee on uh, environment, climate change and sustainability, which was composed of faculty, students, staff, and alumni from our three campuses. And uh, ultimately it's co-chaired, and this is a really interesting structure, it's co-chaired by a professor in our School of the Environment and our Chief Operating Officer for Facilities and Services. So we've got both the academic side of the house and the operations side of the house together, uh, talking about you know how the teaching and the research and the learning opportunities that our students are thirsting for could help accelerate our progress on the operations side. And, uh, and conversely, how these really interesting and tough problems to solve in real time, in real places on our campuses could generate learning opportunities for our students and research opportunities for our faculty, many of whom are working in you know, clean tech and uh, clean energy solutions or on these behavioral questions, you know, about how you change the behavior of economic actors. So um, that really got the ball rolling. That became the focal point for so much of uh, what we had decided to do in all of those realms. It led to our first sort of low carbon action plan, which I think was published about five years ago, which then uh, was superseded by our climate positive the campus plan uh, that we've been speaking of earlier. Uh, and it has been a, a driving force for a lot of this change. And I would say so important in bringing people together. We, we have gone out of our way to make sure that the membership of that committee is very open, including people who are the most critical of the administration and really, you know, keeping my feet to the fire. Um, if one can use such metaphors in, in you know, one these can. days. One yeah, can. yeah. Um, and, you know, it's great to have uh, people looking over our shoulder and saying, well, you know, why are you doing it this way and not that way? Or pointing us to innovative solutions that are happening elsewhere. So that was a really, really critical piece of the, the puzzle. There's no doubt about it. And it, it has really helped drive things. Along the way, one of the things that we discovered when we first uh, generated our low carbon action plan, and this blew me away, was that the University of Toronto was the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the public sector in the province of Ontario. Surprise. You know, yeah, <laughs> second behind, uh, I think, the city of Toronto and the Toronto District School Board, right? And that was kind of an aha moment for us. It was an oh wow or oh something else moment, to be honest, um, which is underscored. It, is, 
Yeah, sorry. Is yeah. it is it your downtown mining operations that are causing this? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, in fact, that I mentioned that we have a district heating system, yeah. and that big power plant has a has a smokestack, yes. which uh, is powered, you know, by natural gas, and so that alone accounts for a huge amount of uh, of our emissions. Can I stop but, you yeah, for one? Can I stop yeah. you for one second? I want you to continue it, but. Um, can you uh, specifically just 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 a little bit? So this the the project that is in uh, um, the King's College Circle, um, yes. which is I guess going to be partially dug up, and you know, um, um, can you just very briefly? I mean, basically, it's a massive heat pump system. It is. It is. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. So we call it the landmark project. It is right outside my window here. In fact, you know, I I have a wonderful vantage point so I can keep tabs on their progress. The original idea was King's College Circle is this lovely green space in the heart of our campus with a road that goes around it. And our original thought was, let's get rid of all the cars, get them off the, off the road. The city of Toronto said, that's great, but you, you've got to provide some kind of parking somewhere for them because otherwise you're going to be driving all of these car owners into the neighborhoods around your campus and your neighbors aren't going to be too happy. So we thought, okay, well, I guess we'll we'll build a level of underground parking under the circle. And then uh, another one of those aha moments where we thought, well, if we're going to dig a big hole, we're going to make a mess. Why don't we explore the possibility of creating uh, a clean energy solution at the same time that would really help uh, accelerate our progress towards our, our climate goals? So um, again, the you know the, the chief operating officer and his co-chair of the the committee on environment, climate change, and sustainability got behind this amazing project. Um, what we're doing is uh, drilling. In fact, they've already been drilled 374 holes, 250 meters deep. That's about half the height of the CN Tower for any of your viewers who've been yeah. to Toronto or know, you know, that landmark. Um, and forming basically what, what's called a geo exchange system is basically a giant heat pump. So, you know, in the summer, we'll pump excess heat out of a, a whole uh, district of buildings, which will be stored underground. And then that that heat will be pumped back up in the winter to to, to warm the buildings and also, by the way, to melt the snow yeah. on the, uh, the, the the pedestrian ring road or cycling ring road that we're going to be building. We'll cover this parking structure over and re-green the whole space, plant lots of trees, um, and uh, it will be beautiful. And uh, at the same time, we'll be offsetting 15,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas every year that's about 3,000 cars that you'd be taking off the road, which is an amazing uh, feat. Uh, we're also, and this is really cool, building an underground classroom. So our engineering, our mechanical engineering students will be able to see this system in action. The technology is not new, as you know. You know, heat pumps have been around, ground source heat pumps have been around for a long time. The scale is breathtaking. Uh, and it was actually a late professor, Frank Hooper, in our engineering faculty, who proved that this technology would be viable in a cold climate like Canada's. Uh -huh. uh, but it took us a few decades to kind of um, apply his idea at scale. And this is the largest, but uh, one of four uh, similar geoexchange fields that we uh, have or will have constructed. We've got another one uh, not too far from here that is going to be heating and cooling, a new residence dormitory that we're building. Again, just uh, a lovely project. So it's a little messy outside my office right now, but a year from now, it'll all be done and it's going to be amazing. Well, one of the, th it sounds like, I mean, the more I hear about this, it sounds like this is a, starting from how it was conceived and organized, it's a dream to hear about such a you know so, i mean you know i know it, it it's a while until completion but to to hear about such such a uh you know a pending success um we need a lot more of them and um what, what i want to go back just a second to one of the things you were talking about so a lot of u of t's buildings are are you know old brick uh late victorian uh 
uh, buildings. And one of the things I love about the project is that there is a the idea that the operational systems inside are completely state of the art uh, in terms of sustainability and technology. And yet you are keeping the sort of the historic, uh, you know, these will be buried inside these yeah. older buildings. I imagine yeah. all kinds of new duct, duct work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's just lovely, you know, that you can preserve. It really is. No, yeah. it is amazing. I mean, we'll be, uh, we've already replaced a lot of windows and we'll be doing more of that. We'll have very smart building controls yeah. that will uh, obviously optimize um, heating and cooling. We have a lot of science buildings that have got, you know, uh, vents uh, uh, for, you know, uh, off-gassing, you know, noxious substances from chemistry labs and that sort of thing. Uh you know, which will be fil of, which will be filtered, of course, before they of, get. <laughs> of course, but you know, uh, in a lot of those buildings, those vents just kind of used to run twenty four seven, um, or at least not very intelligently. And so, you know, one can use controls to uh, optimize those sorts of um, uh, procedures. And we're also going to try and source as much of this technology locally as we can. Toronto has a burgeoning clean tech sector, but a lot of startups and firms that are scaling up and looking for big public sector clients uh, who can showcase their, their services and technologies for them. And we view that as one of the other kind of payoffs from this kind of work, uh, recognizing that we have sort of a responsibility to, to help these companies scale up and grow and, and hopefully find new customers around the world as a result of the solutions that they're providing for us. Um, so, yeah, again, I mean, everything you say just sounds, uh, you know, um, that this, pro you know, indicates that this project is just a, a, you know, wonderfully put together thing. And I say, Merrick Gertler for prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I, I, yeah go ahead I, was, I think you know uh being president of the university is probably a tougher job than being prime minister <laughs> uh but it's it's also very rewarding you know one of the things that motivates us is the the desire to uh not just sort of inspire others to do equally ambitious things but to sort of shift the mood from pe pessimism to optimism, a sense that, you know, uh, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, which is, of course, you know, entirely understandable. People would feel that way these days. Look what's happening in Florida uh, as we speak, uh, or what happened on the East Coast, including Atlantic Canada with uh, Hurricane Fiona. Or Pakistan, so, or, you know. Exactly, exactly. Lungs. Yes, there's no shortage of climate catastrophes. Uh, and yet at the same time, I mean, this could be paralyzing, right? Where you just sort of wring your hands and think, okay, well, why even try to do something? Big public sector actors like us, big, you know, old uh, esteemed organizations like the University of Toronto, I think have a responsibility to A, demonstrate what's possible and B, give people hope. You know, uh, we are... You know, I mentioned the fact that we're, uh, we have 95,000 students. Most of them are pretty young people. They're thinking about their future and they're worried, yeah. really worried. So it's so important for us to be able to give them a sense of hope uh, and that all is not lost when it comes to the battle against um, climate change. Um, just, you know, as you were speaking, I'm, I'm curious, um, what is the University of Toronto and, and even more, I mean, not the University of Toronto, what does the city of Toronto and what do U of T's students think? Are they are they sort of actively inspired by this your uh, U of T's climate positive initiative and, you know, what you're doing? Are you getting a lot of, what kind of feedback are you getting? Yeah, so um, it's been very positive. Um, and that's kind of new because, you know, for a long time, um, a lot of students and, and many faculty colleagues were skeptical that we were really committed to this. And I think when they see the scale of what we're doing, when they see the ambition and when they see the innovative 
character of this. I think they they are now convinced that we mean business that, and that we um, are on a good path. The city of Toronto has really, um, both with a capital C and with a small C, been very interested in what we're doing. You know, as people have come back to the city following the pandemic, they're looking around and they're noticing a few changes, including this big construction project outside my window, which has really generated a lot of buzz. We've had a lot of visitors come and look in the holes and, you know, yeah. see what we're doing. The Toronto Region Board of Trade recently created a Climate Economy Strategy Council, and they've decided to highlight what they call lighthouse projects. These are big, uh, impactful initiatives to address uh, the climate crisis and to accelerate the Toronto region's progress towards net zero. And they've decided to designate the University of Toronto as one of two of their initial landmark projects. There's another project that's uh, taking shape at Pearson International Airport, where they are ambitiously planning to create a hydrogen hub at the airport, which is going to be quite amazing. So, you know, what these two projects have in common is A, they're both public sector players. B, we own a lot of land. C, we're in a position to make decisions centrally that when implemented can really move the needle pretty far, pretty fast. Yeah. And, you know, and we have an appetite for risk and an inclination to innovation, right? To do something new and different uh, rather than, you know, sitting back passively and waiting for others to work things out. So, uh, you know, we've been thrilled to be uh, kind of uh, highlighted through that work. And the Board of Trade is uh, hosting a climate summit uh, in a few weeks time at which uh, I'll be one of the featured speakers and we'll be talking about our project. They'll also be writing up what they call a playbook which uh, will be available for other public sector organizations. I've already had calls from so many places um, who are interested in you know, learning about what we've done and uh, how they might be able to apply some of the lessons learned here in their own backyard. Yeah. Well, again, I think it's just, it's just every, every, every piece of it sounds, you know, well thoughtfully, uh, uh, you know, planned and, um, again, you know, it's, it's it, the, the hope part of it is, is really is, is, is so important because, you know, as you say, we all see what's happening and there are, you know, there are, there are clearly ways to address it. And uh, yep. I'm just, I, I'm a huge fan of, you know, of yours, but also of, of what you guys are doing. It's, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I hope that this is a, a project, you know, that gets a lot, you know, that we're doing, uh, you know, on Green TV, a little bit to sort of spread the word, and that this word gets spread because that's what needs to happen for things like this, and you know, to to, to really make a a dent in uh, in in some of these giant climate challenges that we have. Um, I couldn't I couldn't agree more, Chris. Um, well, so look, I I, I think uh, our time is sort of coming to a close. Um, is there anything, uh, anything that I didn't ask you? Is there anything that you, you know, have been, you know, saying, I wish you would ask me about this and uh, anything you want to add? Maybe the only thing I would add is that we've got solutions in our grasp, right? And everything I've talked about, none of it is rocket science. Yeah. Um, and yes, there will be more innovations to come that are both technological and organizational. The organizational is actually as important as the technological, you know, how you bring people together, how you craft innovative financial models, uh, how you change behavior, you know, all of these things are complementary to the technologies themselves. But we've got all the tools at our disposal now. So it takes some willpower uh, and it takes some leadership. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm happy to be in that position. Well, uh, I'm happy you are, and I, I really want to thank you uh, so much uh, for being with us today, Merrick. So We'd be happy, uh, happy to to publicize this for sure. Okay, I really appreciate that that you're you know you're you're taking the time to show us uh, how U of T uh, and the entire climate positive team are making the green transition you know a reality that it's doable and and best of all that it's that it's being done. And in a cold climate, I mean, you know, our our heating 
and, and uh, other costs associated with that are not not trivial. So if we can do it in these circumstances, that's saying something. That's it for this episode of Business Earth. Thanks for tuning in, and please be on the lookout for upcoming episodes for much more on the green transition. Again, that's most easily done by subscribing to greentv.com and our YouTube channel, which also offers links to most social media by hitting the Show More button just above the comments section. See you next time on Business Earth. Yeah. <laughs>